Kate Berlant is Kate Berlant in Kate. In her one-woman show directed by Bo Burnham, comedian Kate Berlant explores the events of her life that have brought her to this moment. On stage for four weeks only starting January 17th. Tickets at PasadenaPlayhouse.org. Fresh off a showcase at the UN Climate Summit, now you can see the National Youth Poet Laureate of the United States in person. Salome Agbaroji is our feature performer at the next Prose Bowl, Friday, January 12th. Get your tickets at LAS.com slash events. LAS Studios. There's a phrase we talk a lot about in this town, affordable housing. And it's usually in the context of LA not having enough of it. The city of Los Angeles has expended significant resources over the years trying to combat rising housing costs. Affordable housing developers say the city takes too long to permit housing for low-income and unhoused residents. One housing economist I spoke with compared the city's efforts to pouring a cup of water into the Santa Monica Bay and expecting to see a change. Numbers tell us LA County is lacking more than 499,000 affordable units, and it's not really clear how officials will make that up. One big reason this matters is that there are hundreds of thousands of unhoused people living here, and thousands more on the brink of losing their homes because of expensive rent or other issues. That problem can't really be addressed until there are more places available that low-income people can afford. This is How to LA, the show that helps you navigate this city. I'm your host, Brian De Los Santos. Today, we're going to get into this idea of affordable housing, what it really means, and where it came from. If you shop for an apartment in recent years, you're probably questioning if there's any affordable housing in the region. But there was a time when the government made real efforts to keep housing affordable. LA Explain reporter Kaylin Hernandez went on a history hunt to understand what affordable housing was intended to do in LA. Hey, Caitlin. Hi, Brian. First things first, what does affordable housing really mean? So this is a good question. There's the idea of basically what's affordable on an individual level, like what I can afford depending on my income and how I want to budget. But then there's also what an expert told me is called like capital A affordable housing. Hmm. And that's kind of like this big, broad patchwork of programs where you have grants, um, trust funds, and all of these different government initiatives to try and solve our housing crisis through like subsidies and, you know, market rent and all that jazz. So there's two kinds of affordable housing, but I'll be here to talk about the second one. So price wise, because that's what everyone's kind of interested in. What amount is considered affordable? Uh, It really does vary by person, but there's kind of like this societal norm, at least, you know, what I've heard through friends and and kind of broader online now is like the idea of what is affordable is usually like you shouldn't spend more than 30 percent of your income on housing. Um, And that's like a budget I try to live by. And, you know, all my family has tried before. But it's really interesting because that whole idea of 30 percent actually comes from Congress. Um, The Brooke Amendment was passed in 1969, and that was the first kind of thing that set an income percentage limit. It was meant for public housing and some types of affordable housing programs, um, but it really kind of came into the broader societal conscious. Can you break it down for us where we stand with affordable housing right now in LA County? I mentioned what we're lacking, but can you paint a bigger picture of the numbers for us and kind of like what's at stake? So our affordable housing stock is really on a ticking clock. Um, And I'll back up here to give some perspective. So in 2022, LA County had almost 134,000 affordable rental housing units. And, you know, these are ones that fit under the definition of affordable, but also the ones that are involved in government programs that are super restricted and controlled. Um, But nearly 8,000 of those places were at risk of losing affordability, meaning that they would fall out either by their covenant, which I'll explain in a second, or, um, you know, they could be at risk of being taken off the market because the developer is going out of business or something like that. Um, So affordability requirements are governed by legal contracts known as covenants. That's where the owner agrees to maintain a unit as affordable for a specific period of time. And typically in Los Angeles, that's 55 years. 
So mm. when you look at our affordable housing stock and when it was built, a lot of the units that are affordable are, are really on that, that lifeline now. We'll be right back after this. Kate Berlant is Kate Berlant in Kate. In her widely celebrated one-woman show directed by Bo Burnham, revered comedian Kate Berlant explores the events of her life that have brought her to this moment. Embodying many characters in this tour de force performance, she expertly morphs before our eyes and exposes a truth she has, until now, kept hidden. On stage at Pasadena Playhouse for four weeks only. Performances begin January 17th. Get your tickets now at PasadenaPlayhouse.org. Hey, it's Francis Lamb, host of The Splendid Table. Our show is all about the intersection of food and life, and we're heading to Southern California. Elias is hosting a special live taping of our show in Orange County, where we'll have a chance to talk to some of the stars of the OC's vibrant food scene. And after the show, we'll all get a bite of something delicious to eat. So join us February 4th at South Coast Rep. Get your tickets now at elias.com slash events. And we're back. You're listening to How to LA, and we're in studio with Caitlin Hernandez. Now, the push for affordable housing is not unique to LA. It's something that a lot of cities are grappling with. And I understand from your reporting that on a government level, the talk of affordable housing started during the Great Depression. Tell us more about the Housing Act of 1937. Yes. So this 1937 act created the first federal public housing program where states had to establish local housing authorities. So this was kind of like the first big step where you had the federal government working with, you know, state and local authorities to kind of address this like broader housing issues. Um, But during the Great Depression, in this backdrop, you know, we had a really bad housing stock problem. Housing quality was a big issue. So the act itself in 1937 made a clear goal that it was there to try and remedy this unsafe housing crisis that was happening and the shortage. Um, In those days, it was really common for especially like low income people to live in housing that didn't have access to like hot running water. So it was really Mm -hmm. not a great time. Yeah. No, and I, from what I understand, there were like new mortgage programs that were introduced in the 30s to make it easier to buy a house. But it really wasn't until 1959 that developers were brought into the mix. Why did this happen? Yeah. So up until this point, you kind of mostly had the government trying to manage and pay for and take care of all these things. But in 1959, that was kind of like the first like significant time where pr- the private market was brought in. Mm. Um you know, public housing during this time was starting to lose favor in 1959. You had like the Red Scare going on. So some of the the perception of that was shifting. But on paper, 1959 was when financial incentives were used to bring in the private market. And this was kind of to try and address some equality issues that were going on in housing programs. A lot of them were really geared towards extremely low or just low income folks. And there wasn't too much going on for middle income people. So this initiative in 1959 uh, marked their try to get um, assistance for middle income housing for people, specifically 62 years and older. Can you expand on the connection to the Red Scare? So the Red Scare part is interesting. Um, It's during the time of like the Cold War and, you know, there's the ideas of like socialism bleeding into to how our society is structured with government. So some of that came into the affordable housing world because in the early stages, like we talked about, affordable housing was largely managed by the government and mostly the government. Um, And so especially like when it came to like public housing, which is housing that's managed and owned by the government. We don't really do that anymore because of Red Scare fears. So people didn't want big government coming in and providing everything and creating like this quote unquote socialist economy. Um, And so that's why largely our market has gone to the um, private sector. In the 1970s under the Nixon and Ford administrations, what happened and how did it play out here in L.A.? It's interesting when the Nixon administration was ending uh, in the 70s, one of the last things he did was do a moratorium on federal housing programs. And this really led to what's called the devolution of authority. Um, It's really a jargony way to say that the federal government was trying to offload the responsibility of 
creating and managing affordable housing initiatives, um, including building. Uh, and this is again coming off of the whole idea of like red scare. So you have federal government that's really, you know, getting its hands out of affordable housing because people were really, you know, stoking fears of communism going on, especially in LA. So one of the big changes that came after that moratorium was a community block grant program. And so this was really a way for the federal government to give out money to do these programs and build housing or, you know, kind of rehabilitate. I think the word is like slum properties. But the responsibility and determination of like how the dollars were spent were kind of you know, not, it wasn't too strictly much of an oversight on the federal level. So that was a big shift. So to wrap this up, you know, you went through the history of affordable housing. You did your research on kind of how things are at right now in LA County. What have you learned? And do we know if there's new projects coming? Definitely. I mean, the setup of where private developers work with the federal government or or local states to agree to make affordable units, that's like a common practice. So developers will sometimes agree to reserve a certain number um, that will be kept under like a rent cap or an income restriction or a mixture of both. But, you know, like you said at the top, it's not something we can really keep up with. Uh, You said this number, but L.A. County is still short a massive half million affordable homes. So they're coming, but, you know, it's not enough. That is Caitlin Hernandez, LA Explain reporter for LAist. Thank you so much for joining me, Caitlin. Thank you. We'll be back here tomorrow with a new episode of How to LA. Please tune in. This episode was produced by Monica Bushman. Our other team members include Erica Washington, Megan Botel, Victoria Alejandro, Evan Jacoby, and our intern, Tony Morales. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. 